All right. So this week, what you have a couple of assignments uh, welcoming you back from your break. We have the journal 27. You only have three readings this week, so super short on that one. You have unit 10 document set three. You have the Korematsu evaluation. That one has quite a few uh, short excerpts with it. Make sure you leave yourself some time uh, to set aside to do that. There are only three questions you need to answer across those different excerpts, but uh, make sure you're using the reading to help you do so. Uh, and those are your three assignments for this week. Remember, your short paper is also posted. That's not due until uh, April 23rd. You still got some time, but make sure you are looking towards that. All right, so last we talked, we ended uh, World War II. We talked a little about the post-war uh uh, United Nations that was put together in order to guide us through uh, what what life would look like after this second world war uh, but now we have to look at the home front post uh, post war uh, and some of this is going to take place during the war uh, so the timeline is a little bit uh, here and there but we're looking at how did people how did we handle uh, what was being experienced in World War II. So first we need to look at the Nuremberg trials. Uh, before we talk about Nuremberg, we have to kind of go back a little bit. The Geneva Convention was a series of diplomatic meetings that had produced a number of agreements, but what we need to pay attention to here is that the Geneva Convention produced the Humanitarian Law of Armed armed conflicts, which was a group of international laws for the humane treatment of wounded or captured military personnel, medical personnel, and non-military civilians during war or armed conflict. Now, this agreement is going to originate in 1864, but we know, based on what we've talked about with just the treatment of the prisoners of war by the uh, Japanese, we know that these were being broken. We know about Nazi Germany and how the people were being treated in the, in, in the concentration camp. So we know that none of this humanitarian law was being held up during World War II. So we have to update all of these laws and we have to hold the people accountable that had broken these laws. So the Nuremberg trials are going to do just that. We're looking to update the Geneva Convention. We're looking to hold people accountable. We're looking to set a precedent saying you cannot do what was just done ever again and expect to not pay for it. Now, the Nuremberg trials are going to be held by the Allies to, again, try uh, those that had committed war crimes during World War II. Now, for the United States, we have Robert H. Jackson as the chief prosecutor. Uh, Jackson is going to be from uh, right outside Jamestown, New York, so very close to our area. He is going to have a history in politics. He joined the New Deal administration of FDR. He's going to rise through uh, the different uh jobs in the legal system, first starting as the IRS legal counsel to the assistant uh, attorney general, then he's going to be the solicitor general, and finally he'll be the attorney general. Uh, Roosevelt's going to appoint Jackson to the Supreme Court in 1941, um, and then uh, for the Nuremberg trials, uh, Jackson's going to serve as the chief U.S. prosecutor to go after these war criminals at the conclusion of World War II. Now, when we look at what we're doing here, uh, we kind of have to look at how these war crimes were mentioned throughout the war. It's not that people were ignoring them because in December of 1942, uh, the Allied leaders are going to issue a joint declaration officially noting that mass murder of European uh, Jews uh, and is 
going against the Geneva Convention, and they resolved to prosecute those responsible for the vi the violence against civilians. Uh, it, but but they didn't really say how. Uh, they didn't really say when. They just make that statement in 1942. Now Stalin is going to propose the execution of 50,000 to 100,000 German staff officers. Winston Churchill discussed the possibility of a summary execution, which was executions without trial of the high-ranking Nazis, uh, but was persuaded by American leaders uh, to kind of go a different way, that there should be a criminal trial, that that would be more effective, uh, that the criminal proceedings would uh, look at the documentation of the crimes, charge the defendants, and, and make an example to prevent later uh, war crimes. So there are going to be many legal and uh, procedural difficulties that they have to overcome with the Nuremberg trials because there was never an international trial of war criminals before. There were instances where people were persecuted for war crimes, but never to this scale uh, and never uh, uh, to this extent. Uh, eventually, the Allies are going to establish the laws and procedures for the Nuremberg trials with the London Charter of International Military Tribunal. This is going to come along in August of 1945, and the Charter is going to define three categories of crimes. First, there's going to be crimes against peace, which included the planning, preparing, starting, or waging wars of aggression or wars in violation of, uh, in violation of international agreements. We're going to have war crimes uh, that were violations of customs or laws of war, and then we're going to have crimes against humanity, including murder and enslavement, deportation of civilians, or prosecution of political, religious, or racial grounds. Uh, and, and these are the different categories that we're going to try these crimes in. What we see come out of Nuremberg, and the most important piece here, is that individuals are going to be tried and sentenced for their war crimes. And this sets a precedent, a legal precedent for the future, saying individuals are not protected by orders. They, they can and they will be tried for their crimes. They can and will be uh, punished for those crimes. And, and what this also leads to is the development of international criminal law. Our goal with the Nuremberg trials, just like our goal with the United Nations, was to fix the problems that we missed at the end of World War I. We have to make sure that this does not happen ever again in the way that it happened here. We want to prevent another Holocaust. We don't, we don't want this to go unspoken, so the Nuremberg trials address that. Also post-World War II, the United States has to take a long, hard look at themselves and say, what do we do now? Because we are at a true uh, impasse here. We can go back to isolation, we can do what we did after World War I, or we can pick the other path. We can choose the other option, which is to remain a leader on the world stage. And what we do come to is the idea that we have to remain involved in the, the international affairs of the world because we cannot retreat post-World War II like we did post-World War I and expect different results. On top of that, Americans have become extremely invested in international affairs. They have been following the war on the radio day by day, minute by minute. They don't want to leave that behind. They want to remain involved. They want to remain hearing about uh, international affairs and our connection to those. Plus what we realize, thank God we realize this, uh, the world economy and the political health of the world affects the United States. If there is a depression in Europe, 
there will be a depression in the United States. And if we shelter ourselves from those happenings, the ripple will hit us and it will be unexpected. Therefore, we cannot exclude ourselves from the world economy. Politics, the political health of the world, we cannot allow ourselves to ignore what happens in Europe anymore. We saw part one, part two of the World War saga, and we cannot... Uh, if we cannot retreat to that, well, it'll just get better. Let them handle it. It's an ocean away. We now know that doesn't work. Thank God we realized that as well. We also realize that national security and world security are one and the same. If we want our nation to be secure and we don't want uh, negative uh, actions coming towards the United States, well, then we need to make sure that the world is secure. So we now have a vested interest in making sure that everybody is safe, that everything is secure. Also on the home front, we touched on this briefly before break, but the what we see happening on the home front is going to be a, a huge pivot from before the war. We are seeing in World War II the last of the segregated fighting in war. Okay, we talked about the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, we talked about how the war is, or the military is going to be desegregated in, in 1948, which is huge. But we can't neglect the fact that during World War II, we saw segregation in all facets of our military. And, and what that results in is a two-front war being fought. Not only are we going to be fighting the dictators overseas and fighting for freedoms, for protections of people, but we're also going to have to fight racism at home. We're going to see uh, an example of racism uh, in just a second here, but we need to kind of put our money where our mouth is when it comes to World War II. We claim to be the defenders of democracy. Remember that arsenal of democracy. But at the same time, we're allowing uh, negativity and mistreatment and um, segregation, uh, violence in the United States occur, and nobody's fighting here for that to happen. But what we do see post-World War II is a renewal of the civil rights movement because we now have people who have fought in two world wars and have not seen better results in the United States. And we are going to see a demand on the home front for civil rights. Uh, Post-war, men are going to be returning home, and upon that return home, women are going to be asked to leave the factories and return home. But this isn't going to be that smooth transition after World War I. Women's roles have evolved. Women have worked in a number of different industries, and post-World War II, you're going to see women demanding equal treatment in the United States as well. And these we're going to pick up in our next unit once we get done with the Cold War and really focus on the changes that are going to be made uh, with women and minorities in the United States. And But what we need to take in here is that it comes as a result of World War II and turning our attention uh, to what was happening and how the world was and how we need to change the United States as well, because we weren't as perfect as what we projected ourselves to be. One example of how we were not so perfect are Japanese internment camps. Now, while I say this, I need you to think of current events, okay? Think about in current times how the, uh, the coronavirus has been referred to in a very derogatory, racist manner, which I'm not going to repeat all of the names that I'm sure you can hear in the news anytime you flip on the TV. But think about how that has evolved into violence towards uh, Asian Americans uh, in the United States. 
okay so just think about how that how the power of that spread of calling it uh, the China virus and that's the only one that I will bring up here but think about how that spread has turned into such hatred and violence towards Asian Americans and parallel that with this idea right here okay first of all the access powers uh, immigrants in the United States are going to face resentment because of what was happening in the war uh, Japanese Americans are going to face deeper backlash post Pearl Harbor. Uh, in February of 1942, FDR is going to sign Executive Order 9066 with the intention of preventing espionage on American shores. So they're going to hide behind this idea that Pearl Harbor was just the first attack, that there were more attacks to come. What this did, Executive Order 9066, was create military zones in California, Washington, Oregon. These are going to be the states with large populations of Japanese Americans. And what we're going to see happen is that this executive order commanded the relocation of Americans of Japanese ancestry. This executive order is going to affect the lives about a, of about 117,000 people, the majority of whom are going to be American citizens. Because of what the United States does with Executive Order 9066, we're going to see other places follow suit. Canada is going to relocate 21,000 of its Japanese residents from the West Coast. Mexico is going to enact its own version, and eventually over 2,000 people of Japanese descent are going to be removed from areas such as Peru, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, to the United States, to what we call these war zones. And the, the idea here, much like we saw in the Spanish-American War, was that we're removing a group of people from the general population and putting them into uh, camps where we can keep an eye on them. And by we, I mean the government can keep an eye on them. So the United States here is responding to the fear of the public that all Japanese are, are going to be planning another Pearl Harbor attack regardless of their citizenship status. And that's what's crazy here. These people were born in America. They were American citizens mourning the same loss that we all were after the Pearl Harbor attack. But I digress. To continue, uh, just hours, even in December of 1941, just hours after the bombing, the FBI is going to round up 1,200 almost 1,300 Japanese community and religious leaders arresting them without any evidence and freezing their assets. In January, arrestees were transferred to facilities in Montana, New Mexico, and North Dakota. Many were even unable to inform their families, and most are going to remain there through the duration of the war. The FBI is also going to begin searching private homes, thousands of Japanese residents on the West Coast seizing items they considered contraband. A third of Hawaii's population was of Japanese descent. Uh, in a panic, politicians are going to call for their mass incarceration. Japanese-owned fishing boats were impounded. Some Japanese res uh, residents are going to be arrested. And 1,500 people, 1% 1 of the Japanese population of Hawaii, are going to be sent to the U.S. mainland to camps. Just to give you an idea of how absolutely insane this was. We're going to have Lieutenant General John L. DeWitt, who was the leader of Western Defense Command. He is going to believe that the civilian population needed to take control to prevent a repeat of Pearl Harbor. He really gives me uh, McCarthy vibes, this DeWitt. Uh, DeWitt prepares this report that's filled with falsehoods, claiming examples of sabotage that are going to later be revealed as literally nothing. No, absolutely no founding here. 
DeWitt is going to suggest the creation of the military zones uh, and Japanese detainment. Uh, he proposes this idea to the Secretary of War and the Attorney General. His original plan also included other Axis uh, immigrants immigrant groups like Italians and Germans, but the idea of rounding up Americans of European descent wasn't as popular, nor was it as easy. Uh, at the time of the congressional hearings in 1942, a majority of the testimonies, including the California governor and the state attorney general, declared that all Japanese should be removed. Now, you might be asking yourself, how the heck did this happen? Well, this is going to be a group that largely was uh, lacking in political representation. There were not people in the government who were fighting for them and their best interests. These are going to be a group that was isolated from the population post Pearl Harbor. So the idea of internment camps wasn't that crazy. When we go from uh, war zones to internment camps, the shift is very easy. Uh, it, when we look at a group that is marginalized in this manner, it opens a door for the government to take advantage without backlash and that's exactly what happened here the army is going to be directed to evacuate beginning on march uh beginning in march of of uh the same year here uh people had six days notice to dispose of their belongings and and anything else that they could not carry with them Anybody who was at least one sixteenth Japanese is going to be evacuated. This included children as well. So we're taking children, we're taking elderly, we're taking handicapped, and they're being forced to leave their homes and everything they had behind, their businesses, their livelihood, their homes. It didn't matter if they were American citizens. Japanese Americans were... were uh, ordered to report to centers near their homes. Um, from there, they're going to be transported to a relocation center where they could live for months before being transferred to a wartime residence. These centers are going to be located in remote areas. Uh, some of them were reconfigured fairgrounds, racetracks that had buildings that were not meant for human habitation. Okay. Uh, some of them are going to be staying in horse stalls, cow sheds that had been converted uh, for that purpose. In Portland, Oregon, you're going to see over 3,000 people that stayed in a livestock pavilion uh, in, uh, uh, from the Pacific International Livestock Exposition Facilities. So we're not looking at uh, great conditions here. Uh, this policy of internment established the camps. These camps are often going to be uh, uh, understocked as far as food and supplies go. You're talking about taking children away from their education. You're taking people away from their businesses. We can talk about the hit that this took to the economy. We can talk about the hit to the education. But that would just be pulling away from the fact that we quite literally pulled these people from their homes and shoved them into camps. Uh, and we've done this before. Look at our track record. We've done it with the Native Americans how many times? This same idea. And we always do it in the interest of, of national security when there were no confounded actual founded threats here uh, from this this community that was uprooted and moved now maybe you're thinking just like i'm thinking when is somebody going to stand up to this when is someone going to take charge well great question because that is what the case of Korematsu versus U.S. is going to be. It's going to answer the question if these internment camps are in fact 
constitutional. So we have Fred Korematsu, who was just 23 years old. He was a Japanese-American citizen. Uh, he is not going to comply with the order to leave his home, despite the fact that his parents had abandoned their home and their business, which was a flower nursery, in preparation for reporting to the camp. Korematsu planned to stay behind. He had this crazy plan that he was going to get plastic surgery to alter his eyes and his appearance, change his name to a more American name, and claim that he was of Spanish and Hawaiian descent. These are the extremes that people were going through to not have to go to these camps. But on May 30th, 1942, about six months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the FBI is going to arrest Korematsu for failure to report to a location center, a relocation center. After his arrest while waiting in jail, he's going to decide to allow the American Civil Liberties Union, which we've talked about before, remember, the defenders of American civil liberties to represent him and make his case a test case to challenge the constitutionality of the government's order. Gormatsu is going to be tried in federal court in San Francisco, convicted of violating military orders and issued that were issued under the Executive Order 9066. He's going to be given five years of, pro of probation and sent on to an assembly center in, uh, in California. But Korematsu's attorneys are going to appeal the trial court's decision to the U.S. Court of Appeals, which agreed that the trial court was right, that he had violated military orders. And then Korematsu opens the door to the Supreme Court, where his case will be heard in December of 1944. The divided Supreme Court is going to rule in a 6-3 to three decision that the detention was a military necessity not based on race, which is insane. The government is going to be upheld in their decision to intern Japanese Americans, saying that it was a military necessity, even knowing there was no threat found in the people that were moved. The internment camps aren't going to end until 1945 following a Supreme Court decision in the case of Endo versus United States where it was ruled that war that the War Relocation Authority had absolutely no authority to subject citizens who were conceitedly loyal to its leave procedure. Huh. Crazy. The case was brought on behalf of Endo, a daughter of Japanese immigrants in Sacramento, after the, the filing of a habeas corpus petition. The government offered to free her, but she refused, wanting her case to address the issue of all Japanese internment. Two years later, the Supreme Court made the decision, but gave Roosevelt the chance to begin camp closures before the announcement. Uh, one day after Roosevelt made his announcement, the Supreme Court revealed its decision. So we see these camps last, and we see uh, them finally closed in March of 1946. But what's crazy here is that Ford, President Ford, is going to be the one who officially repeals Executive Order 9066 in 1976, and it won't be until 1988 that Congress issues a formal apology at all, at which time they pass the Civil Liberties Act, which awarded $20,000 to each uh, of the 80, over 80,000 Japanese Americans as reparations for their treatment. And what I have to say to that is too little, too late. That's 22 years later that an apology and reparations get issued. All from uh, just this fear in people. Extreme violence is taken towards a group of American citizens because of the fear of a group of people that were our own. Just think about that. This, this treatment of this group 
of people has not gone away. While we say it was Japanese internment, it was really internment of Asian Americans. Okay, it didn't matter. They weren't checking uh, your genealogy when putting you in these camps. They were looking at people and putting them in camps based on a fear from an attack which was founded, but blaming a group of our own for that. The parallels to today couldn't be any more clear, but I digress again. All right, we need to start the Cold War. We're going to focus a lot on the Cold War in class this week, but I want to lay the groundwork with the last uh, 10 minutes or so that we have here. Uh, we're going to be spending the rest of this unit on the Cold War. So let's, let's get into how this begins. Uh, a little bit of background here. Post-World War II, United States, superpower. USSR, superpower. Uh, during the war, we had a common enemy. Uh, we knew that we needed to defeat Germany. We knew we needed to defeat Japan. We could set our differences aside to achieve those goals. But what happens here is in the post-World War II world, uh, we are going to see our differences come out. The capitalist a capitalist democracy versus the dictatorship of the Communist Party. The United States, as I told you when we went over our foreign policy goals a couple of units ago, one of our major goals is that we want to spread democracy because democracy works for everybody and democracy is the best thing that could ever happen to any country ever, period, end of story. So when there is another nation that has a different ideology from ours, we see that as a threat. Now, when we see the USSR rising to the power that it did and it not being a democracy, that is going to be a, a huge sticking point for the United States. Now, I'm not going to argue that a dictatorship uh, is, is good. I'm not going to say that the Communist Party is correct. But I am going to say that the United States could not handle another country that was different from us rising to power and the same, if not equal to power, as we were experiencing for ourselves. Now, where these real roots of, of the, uh, the, this, this uh, fight between, uh, this grudge, that's the word I was looking for, this grudge between the United States and the USSR starts is our post-war goals for Germany. Uh, at Yalta, we have the big three meeting and, and kind of coming up with a plan for the post-war governing of Germany. Uh, when we look at this, we're going to see that we want to divide Germany into four post-war occupation zones that get controlled by the U.S., British, French, and Soviet military forces. We want to do the same with Berlin, uh, and, and we look to demilitarize Germany. So we decide this at Yalta. Great. Okay. Everything looks good. Uh, Stalin uh, at Yalta had agreed to uh, uh, some free elections in Poland. Uh, he, he agreed uh, to kind of... Uh, satisfy some of the demands of the United States. But what happens is Stalin, of course, not very trustworthy. Uh, he's going to change his mind, change his tune at the Potsdam conference, which is going to be the meeting of the big three. But this time it's Truman, Churchill, and Stalin, whereas Yalta was Roosevelt. Okay, so we're changing. We have a change in leadership here. At Yalta, you know the story, we, we are demanding the unconditional surrender from Japan or else, uh, and the or else comes to be the dropping of the bomb, but the or else also happened to be uh, the entering of the USSR uh, to end uh, Japan. But the leaders at this uh, Potsdam conference also came to the agreements on the German economy, um, 
is putting an emphasis on developing agriculture and non-military industries. Uh, they also uh, come up with the idea of trying the war criminals. All of this sounds great. Uh, Stalin's request to define a Polish-German border is going to be put off until the peace treaty is all taken care of. We come to some compromise uh, that, that looks to... Uh, the western zone of raw materials from the east. Uh, it also resolved a dispute uh, for the precedent of managing Germany's economy by zone rather than one uh, comprehensive uh, peace as they had hoped, as the western powers had hoped. Uh, but what happens here is that uh, Truman's going to hear of the successful atomic bomb test, realize he's not going to need Stalin to end the war against uh, Japan. And I, I mean, you know, Stalin's going to know of this new weaponry. He's going to change his mind on a few pieces that were talked about at Yalta, that were talked about at Potsdam, and the biggest piece is those free elections in Europe. He's going to yank that. Now, as one of our goals is to get the people to have a democracy everywhere in the world, we don't really like this idea. And it creates and it plants the seed of suspicion between Truman and Stalin. Truman is going to be extremely suspicious of the Soviets. Truman's going to say that he likes Stalin, but he's very smart. He's very cunning. And to have a dictator uh, in a nation that has the Red Army, uh, to know how cunning and how manipulative and how uh, untrustworthy a leader like that could be with that kind of might, it puts Truman on the defense. And this is where we see the Cold War beginning, a 46-year-long struggle that will have military skirmishes throughout, but never erupting in that World War III. Uh, we, we will hear of the Iron Curtain descending, where we have the East communist threat versus the West democracy. And this is going to be the groundwork for the next phase of international uh, uh, happenings post-World War II. So we go from the hot war of World War II to this uh, war of words, this war of, uh, I don't know, this war of technology, but not really because we don't see it that way. Uh, it's more of a fight for land is what this Cold War turns into. And it really is communism versus democracy. Who can have the most, uh, who can have the most areas where communism exists and who can have the most areas where democratic governments exist? And that's the basis of this Cold War. Now, on the side of the Soviet Union, the causes, uh, the, this, the problem comes because Americans had been very weary of Soviet communism, and they were very concerned about the Russian leader Stalin's tyrannical rule of his country. Uh, the Soviets had resented Americans for decades as well, refusing to treat the USSR as a legitimate part of the international community and they kind of resented our delayed entry to World War II uh, that had resulted in the deaths of a lot of Russians. After the war ends, those grievances kind of ripen, they bubble up to the surface, and we see this mutual distrust between the two. Another piece that adds just another layer, post-war Soviet expansion in Eastern Europe is going to fuel Americans' fear that the Russians had planned to take over the whole world. Uh, on the flip side, the USSR is going to come to resent what they perceive as uh, 
American officials building up uh, uh, our military, our, our weaponry, that we are taking an interventionist approach to international relations. They don't really like that. And it creates a hostile atmosphere where no single party is going to be entirely to blame. Uh, most historians are going to, in fact, say that this Cold War was inevitable with these developing ideologies. Uh, what we have to come up with, and you're going to hear me talk about this uh, for the rest of the unit, is a plan for containment. Okay, Stalin had begun to occupy areas throughout Europe. As you can see on the map there, all of the red are what we call satellite states. Okay, uh, the purple is going to be USSR aligned until 1948, and the orange is going to be USSR aligned until 1960. That's a lot of color on that map that the United States did not like to see because that represented the spread of communism and that drive of communism spreading throughout the entire world and taking over the United States and ruining our democracy is going to put a whole new fear in, in Americans. And fear is an extremely strong driving force. What, what makes communism so successful in this Eastern Bloc is that their economies and governments had been weakened by World War II, okay? Okay. There was no strong representative body that could hold off the communist revolts in these places. So what had happened was that communism seemed to work. The appeal of communism seemed to hold. And, and in places that had been weakened, that did not have a strong leader, that that's economy was suffering communism seemed to work and the next threat that was going to come was communism in Greece and Turkey and what happens and we make an example out of Greece and Turkey is that money could solve the communism problem aid in the form of money and military force could stop communism from spreading and that's what we're going to talk about this week this idea of containment uh, that that comes about uh, from a diplomat, George Keenan, in a long telegram explaining that the Soviet Union was a political force committed fanatically to the belief that with the U.S. there can be no permanent agreement between parties that disagree. And ever since that idea was planted, America's only choice becomes long-term, patient but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expansion tendencies. And it becomes the policy of the United States to support peoples who were resisting attempted takeover by outside pressures, outside communist pressures. And this way of thinking is going to shape American foreign policy for the next four decades, which we'll dig into this week with the Cold War. I just want to remind you of your assignments that you have. Remember, you've got those three readings this week for your journal. You have your Unit 10, Document Set 3, and you have Korematsu versus United States excerpts to read and questions to evaluate uh, using evidence from those readings. Make sure all of these get submitted by Friday at 11.59 and any questions that you have, let me know. I will see you in class.